This is Love Your Work. On this show, we help you find your unique signature as a creative entrepreneur. I'm David Cadavy. I've been a solopreneur for more than 10 years. I'm an award-winning designer. I've written a couple best-selling books, Designed for Hackers and Now the Heart to Start. From my closet in Colombia, I have interviewed titans of industry like Steve Case. I've interviewed best-selling authors like Seth Godin and James Altucher. I've interviewed experts on behavioral science, creators from dancers to a chef to a Hollywood set designer. I want to find out how each of them discovered what made them one in a million And I bring those insights to you so you can find out what makes you one in a million too. If you are new here, welcome. Again, I'm David Cadavy. If you want to join us here on Love Your Work every Thursday, please hit subscribe on your podcast app and get my free creative productivity toolkit. Sign up at cadavy.net slash tools. Today, we have a great discussion on making art that sells, art that is marketable. Phil Thompson is the illustrator and business mind behind Cape Horn Illustration, which sells prints and posters often with a Chicago theme. Phil's portfolio of products includes maps of microbreweries in Chicago, marathon maps for all the major marathons, and home portraits. His work has been featured on the sets of major motion pictures like The Big Sick and Blockers. Phil also happens to be my mastermind partner. We have been talking every two weeks about how to balance our individual artistic visions with what the market wants. So we've learned a lot in our conversations And I'm really excited to be sharing Phil and his work with you today. So today we will talk about how do you validate your art, hear about Phil's first experiments in selling his artwork online, what did he learn from his first success, what did he learn from his first big failure, how do you make your art marketable, learn to think about what your art does for someone, how does that translate into sales, and how can you turn your interests into profitable art. I love how Phil has been able to take his curiosities whether it is running marathons or learning about Chicago architecture, and he's been able to use those curiosities to fuel profitable art. Just a quick update on my Columbia visa status since people have been asking. If you're new, basically I made an investment in a company here in Columbia. I applied for a visa. I was rejected for that visa. It was a really big disruption. I was forced to leave the country last minute. I am back in the country, but now unfortunately I'm just a tourist, which means that I have to watch the number of days that I spend in the country. So one way that I'm going to buy some time is I'm going to take a trip to Peru soon. I'll spend two weeks in, uh, it looks like it'll be Cusco. I'll go check out Machu Picchu while I'm at it. Uh, So this is part of the adventure of living in another country. Sometimes you're forced to take a trip that you didn't really intend to take, which is kind of nice in a way, but it's also very disruptive to your normal routine and it means unexpected expenses. So it looks like I'll be able to keep the show on track with the same quality Thank you so much for all the new Patreon supporters who have come through. Support actually doubled during this crisis. So it really means a lot to me that you care enough about my well-being and about the show to support the show. So if you'd like to support the show, you can do that at academy.net slash donate. We are very, very close to having all production and publishing expenses fully listener supported. So that would be really, really amazing. Again, that is at academy.net slash donate. And there's all sorts of goodies in it for you too. Here is Phil Thompson. I'm here with uh, Phil Thompson of Cape Horn Illustration, also my mastermind partner. Uh, So Phil, you, you draw for a living. I remember when I first was a graphic designer, um, there was kind of a running joke that everybody you talked to just thought that you drew all day. So do you literally draw all day? I would say I spend a good portion of my day drawing, but there is also a lot of other stuff mixed in with that. There's always administration, marketing, setting up the website, stuff like that. So yeah, there's some days that are dedicated to just drawing, but most days I try to mix it up just to kind of give myself a little bit of um, variety in my life. So, and, and what is the stuff that you would, how would you categorize what it is that you draw? I have kind of come to the conclusion that my thing is the cityscape. Yeah. The forms that the city takes, homes, buildings, maps, kind of the urban domain. Mm -hmm. That's just what kind of has interested me. And that's where I've found kind of my niche. It's what I find, find people respond to. It's what I'm always inspired by. It's all around me. So 
yeah, I would say, you know, anything that has to do with the kind of the organic forms of the city. So, and I mean, I guess the, I think that the, the, one of the first things that I saw that you were drawing that you were selling was the marathon maps. Was it the first thing or were there things before that? I think at the time that I met you, I had maybe two products. I had I started with the map of the beer bars, Chicago's best beer bars. I remember I remember talking about the map of the beer bars when we were in Second City. Uh, was it writing class or improv class? That it was had? level A improv class. Okay. So I got the idea for the beer bars map when a friend and I were just in the map room, which is one of the best beer bars in Chicago. It's kind of one of the oldest, has a lot of tradition. Yeah. And I was sitting in there and of course the place is plastered with maps, different types of maps, maps of Chicago. Right. And I don't know what it was. It was I just was struck with this thought, hey, why not do a map of Chicago's best beer bars? And I can illustrate this because I have I've been drawing all my life. So I thought, oh, why don't I just put this together? I'll just, I'll draw the, the beer bars and I'll put it together in a print that I can sell. Okay. So you were, you were all, always drawing and, uh, but you had kind of a fascination with maps, right? Yeah. Like you've, you've had a fascination with maps for a while. Where did that, that come from or where did that start? I'm not sure where that started. I think it kind of ramped up as I was doing more traveling, it became when I, when I started traveling to Europe, collecting vintage maps kind of became a thing, became a way to remember the cities we visited. It was just like, it's it's something that just hit all of the interests. It was like history. It was showing the city. It was kind of a memento for the place we were. And I think that's, that's kind of where it came from. It was just, it was just like a way to capture travel. And then I just got an appreciation for like the great, can I say, like the way the maps kind of unfold. It's one of those things where you put it up in your wall, you put it in your study and, you know, there's more to look at every time you, like every time you look at it, there's something else to discover. So uh, I think the interest in maps kind of came in parallel with me actually creating illustrated maps, which kind of followed things I was interested in. So at the time that I did the beer bars map, I was interested in craft beer. It was still kind of a a new thing. It was like, you know, it wasn't a completely new scene, but it was like definitely in its early stages. I just remember... You know, the first time I went to the map room, somebody's like, Oh, you got to try this. This is like your first craft beer. He's like, This is the one. This is like the entry level craft beer. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's just, there's just so many. No, every, like, now every bar is a craft <laughs> beer bar. Like it's become ridiculous. I've heard it. I've heard it as like a joke of, uh, uh, women are tired of seeing in a guy's, uh, online dating profile that he's into craft beer. <laughs> I can see that. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm original. <laughs> I know. It, it almost seems like half of the headlines in Chicago these days are like about a, a new brewery opening. So it's a very popular thing. So anyway, yeah. you came up with this idea of making the, the beer map. So it's interesting that you were thinking about what would be marketable, mm -hmm. right? You weren't just um, drawing whatever. I mean, I imagine you were thinking about the marketability of that. Yeah. Absolutely. Were there were there times before that where you thought about creating products from what you drew or trying to figure out how to make money drawing or uh, false starts that came before that moment? No, I, I was really... I think it was just more of an interest in entrepreneurship in general. Like through my job, which was working with small and medium-sized Swedish companies, I got exposed to a lot of interesting entrepreneurs. Most of the people that I worked with were the CEOs who were also the founders of their company. And I just got this really, this really deep appreciation for the great variety of products that you can create and make a living from. Just mm. was like 
stunning because at this company, I was very much a generalist. It wasn't like, oh, we're only working with large consumer products companies or we're only working with automobile. So, so you were a consultant uh, helping Swedish companies mm-hmm. uh, bring their products to the U.S., Correct. right? Right. And so you were, you were helping with all sorts of different products and all sorts of different categories yeah. with that. And you are just like floored at like the number of uh, companies that there are out there providing some kind of solution was to there somebody's problem. Was there a particular one that you saw that was the, the tipping point for you of like, oh, uh, of realizing, wow, you can, there's no limit to the number of, things that you can think of? I think, you know, one of them that kind of stuck out was a company that kind of formed, it formed as a result of a college project. These guys are mm-hmm. in business school and they they were tasked with this mission to go out and kind of find a problem. So they went out and they talked to doctors and nurses and diabetes clinics and they just asked them, like, what is your biggest issue here? Like, what are your biggest problems? And they kind of found that there was a lot of consensus around one particular problem, which was that they had to deal with many, many different types of uh, blood glucose meters and insulin pumps. They all have, they're all kind of, they all have data and they all have their own software. So that means whenever they want to download data from these devices, they have to use like the, the proprietary, proprietary software, software for that device. Right. So it's not open data. No. So these guys said, well, why don't we build something that builds software that can read all of this data and then shoot it out into a unified, consistent report. So in order to do that, they needed to get permission from all of the the manufacturers to like open their data. They said, all right, listen, you know, there's this one company that's like a major player has like a large market share. So they were able to go to the smaller players and get them on board. They said, let's take market share from this big player. If you open your data, like let us read your data and then turn into this nice, beautiful, consistent report, we can get all these clinics more interested in your products oh. versus the main player. And they did that. And in Sweden, like they flipped the market from this one player dominating the market. I think it was Medtronic. To and I imagine Medtronic initially probably wasn't amenable to this idea exactly. of opening their data. Yeah. But they were able to, to, to make it an appealing case for the for the other smaller right. manufacturers and they flipped the market. Yeah. So Medtronic's like, we're not, we're not playing with you. And, you know, they still, you know, to my knowledge, they still don't work with this company, even though they've been able to help kind of flip the market, mm-hmm. like help these other companies. So yeah, to me, it was kind of this interesting case of this company, like finding the problem and then creating the solution. And you know, besides companies like that, there were just all sorts of companies that are providing all kinds of like niche things. There was a company that made the finials, the tops of flagpoles. Yeah. And they just had a huge big corner. <laughs> finials. Of the, yeah. It's called a finial. It's called finials. Yeah. You learn all these crazy. You should uh, create terms. enough finial illustration <laughs> series, just like illustrating yeah. finials. I know. Through, yeah. What was the finials of that they were? In the Revolutionary War that they're carrying, what was right. the finial at that time? And yeah, I'm sure there's people who are into it. You know, fetish. And, and and so, fetishes. So, and so from that, yeah, you were you were able to. Um, I mean, I have to be honest. The first time I thought that you, you were, I remember you pitching me this this uh, this beer map idea. I wasn't mm-hmm. sure exactly whether you were going to sell a poster or it was like an app or something. Mm-hmm. It was kind of like, I don't know, that seems like kind of a small market. Is that people going to be interested in that? But, right, right. But, uh, that was like your first idea though. And it was this, this niche thing. Yeah. Well, the beer yeah. map was kind of like, okay, here's, okay. I'm in this, I'm in this kind of cool bar, beer bar 
Your bars are kind of, they're becoming more hip. I like them. This is, you know, if I make an illustrated beer bar map, it's kind of following my interest. I get to learn about the best places. And I'm creating this product that previously didn't exist. That's kind of like serving this particular group of people like me who, who like beer bars, like Chicago. And yeah, I think at the time that I met you, I think I had, maybe I just started to market it or just started to come out with it. And it was, you know, it was doing better than expected. It's one of those things where I just put up a very basic website, really crappy. What tool did you use to put the website? It was, it was just some, it was like a hard coded website. I think Katie, my wife made it for me. It was just like a, like two, two or three pages. It was a very basic website with the kind of PayPal embedded button on it. And I think that was it. It's one product. And so you would collect people's addresses and mail them in a tube. Yeah. This, this drawing that you had. Well, through okay. PayPal, they would, you know, PayPal would process the payment and they'd have to put in their shipping address. And then I just get email, not email order notification and then ship them. Yeah. And you would, you would ship them. It's funny because I don't know, having worked doing kind of developer stuff, it took me a while to realize that you can actually do things where it's not all automated. Mm-hmm. You know, right? I feel like, especially, especially when you come from that perspective, you you expect every. Oh, how how am I going to auto? How am I going to send them the the the, uh, the drawing? Oh, you actually physically get an email notification. Yeah, and you put it in a tube. Yeah. <laughs> And you write the address on a label and you mail it. Exactly. It's like the simplest thing. (laughs) Right. I think it took me a while to realize that, oh, you can do things like that with a lot of stuff in your business. Yeah. What was, uh, there's that inspirational story. I don't know if you heard it about the Grubhub guy. Oh, yeah. Who kind of had no like back end to his site. He just had this kind of nice, front end where it's kind of like here are the restaurants here's the menu and people would just like order on the site he would get the order and then he would call the restaurant so like ha- and he just basically put in a delivery order yes and have them just go to the person's house and then because it was so successful then he justified you know building out the back end you know he, he proved that it was it's like the ultimate lean startup yeah and Grubhub's started quite a while ago. It did, yeah. Right? Like, yeah, maybe 10 years Before ago. there was a lean startup book. Right. I believe. <laughs> before it became a uh, whole like they thing. They proved it out. So yeah, so you, and so you did this this first uh, beer map. Was it selling? Like, how many did you... Were you selling very many? How were you getting people to, to, to buy it? It was, it was one of those things. And I, I feel like I've heard this like similar stories on your podcast from other entrepreneurs it was one of those things where you put it up, you're not sure how it's going to do. And then it kind of like catches somewhere. So I think I had it up and then so I posted the website, I had it already. And I think at one point I just posted the, the beer bar map, the image to Reddit, the Chicago subreddit. And it did okay. Maybe like a hundred upvotes or something like that. Nothing, nothing too crazy, but Thrillist picked it up and then they blasted it out to their thousands of like email list uh, subscribers. And I'd had no idea that they were doing this. And the next day I remember checking my, my personal email and I just had like tons of order notifications. <laughs> I was like, what the hell? <laughs> like, I had no idea what happened. And, and then somebody emailed me and they're like, dude, is, isn't this your beer map? <laughs> I think maybe I'd shared it on Facebook, you know, like, check out this beer map that I did. So then I was kind of more encouraged. I'm like, oh, where else can I put this? So did you have enough to ship out? Yeah. To yeah. fulfill all those orders? Well, I'd done a run of maybe 500 prints or something. Yeah. So I had, yeah, I had a whole bunch in my, uh, my apartment. And then I just kind of kept marketing it and kept pushing it. And, you know, then I moved on to the next print idea. 
And yeah, maybe I actually met you when I had the second print. So I was like, kind of thinking, oh, maybe I could just, I could do this full time. And then I, I remember meeting you and talking to you about what I was doing. And you were just like, yeah, why don't you just quit your job? <laughs> Something like that. Like you were really pushing me to, to just go after it. When I feel like probably 99% of people would be like, well, like, are you making enough to, like, are you making the same amount of money as you yeah. are at your current job? You know, like, you shouldn't leave until you're making the same amount, you know, and you're just kind of like coming from this different world where, you know, you just kind of like take risks and you go after me and jump, jump off the, you know, jump off the, uh, the deep end. That's, that's funny. That's funny because I don't, I guess I don't really think about it too much that way. Because, I mean, I guess that that's a way to do it. Some people do that. So they're able to build up a business while they're working in a job and somehow they're able to make as much money as they're making the job. But to me, it's like, you're in your job eight hours a day. When, when yeah. are you going to build this, this business? And if you, you know, if you can set things up so that you can, so you can go at it yeah. full time, then that, that number starts to go up. To me, that's, that's inconceivable. It's just, you know, the idea like, of making as much as well, the idea of just being able to like to work as hard as you need to on your own thing, on your passion while you're working a full time job is just not, it's just not compatible with my personality. I think I need some urgency. Mm. And I think the urgency comes with. Oh God, like I need to figure this out. Like I need to just jump out of the plane and figure out how the parachute works. I just could, I just can't get fired up. I mean, I, I, I did the beer map after hours, but that was kind of like, I could work on it a few hours here, a few hours there. It wasn't like, okay, I need to really sell. I need to produce more. I need to get this out there. So it was only when. I left my full time job that I was able to really have that kind of level of anxiety. That yeah. I needed to really push. I think that's a good point about personality too, because I, I think, I, again, some people were able to do it, like Jeff Goins is somebody who's been on the show who I think has, has, was able to have his income replaced before he quit his job and mm-hmm. was probably, I think he, had a family who was in a position where he wanted to be more conservative with it. But right. I, I'm very much with you where I, I, I need it as a motivational judo move mm-hmm. in a way to, to feel like I really need to do something. Right. Uh, I, uh, Vinny Loria is somebody who's been on and who, uh, that reminds me of, you know, him quitting IBM and driving across the country to Silicon Valley to, you know, with no plan, you know, when you jump, the net appears is like what he was, he was always saying. So right. you find it motivating to kind of cut it off. So, yeah. So you're saying that nobody else was telling you to, you know, quit, no. give yourself some, no. some time to really invest I mean, in this. No, not, I mean, not at all. Like I don't come from that world. I feel like the idea yeah, of me neither. <laughs> kind of, yeah. I, I think, and I think that's the shame of it all. And I've been reflecting on this a lot lately is that in school, I just remember people being like, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? Like, what do you want to, what do you want to be? And the idea, I think the idea of like taking something that you're interested in or passionate about and turning it into a business or like finding some problems in the market to address is not, they don't teach you to think that way. I think I was only able to get that point of view from my job, working with other entrepreneurs and meeting you and understanding that, okay, all right, I'm interested in this. How can I turn it into something that people will pay for, right? Like, where can I find that intersection between the passion and the, and the kind of market needs? And I feel like if, 
in school, they just, they taught a little bit more the skills that you need, like to sell, for instance, or like how do you market? How do you, or how do you find, how do you like find a problem? Like those guys did with the diabetes software. Then they, I think they get more people who actually would like pursue what they're interested in ra- rather than, Oh, what do I want to be? I yeah. wanna, I'll be an accountant. That's stable. Well, and there's this sort of magic wand mentality too, uh, which I think it took me a long time to be able to deprogram myself out of. And I think part of the reason why they don't teach these things is nobody knows. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or especially when we were kids, really nobody, nobody knew. Um, there's just this, I remember just living in this sort of fantasy that somebody's going to pick you someday mm-hmm. or like, I, I don't know if you're going to be, if you're going to be a famous artist or a, a famous musician or something, you're just going to go to the high school guidance counselor and they're going to hand you like some job application or something <laughs> and you're going to fill it out. <laughs> right. Right. And it's like, it, and it's so much not like that. You have to give yourself the time and the space to be able to pursue it, to create this thing that nobody else has created mm-hmm. uh, and, and to do it. Um, yeah. 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 So, you you did the the map and then um, we talked. I, I don't. I, I guess I did. I don't know if I realized that you had sold that many maps by the time that we had talked. I probably hadn't sold that many. I probably sold maybe like 150 maps, something like that. Yeah, which you know, which is as supplementary. So income. many more than zero. Yeah, definitely. Sure, but it's um, yeah, it wasn't. I had never expected. Any, I hadn't expected much, let's put it that way. So that was kind of encouraging. I was like, all right, well, if I can do that with this, then I'll make another one. So that's when I made the really detailed lakefront map. The first, what I call the lakefront currents, which I thought, okay, this will have a broader appeal. And I spent a long time working on that. And when I came out with it, it wasn't, you know, I, I got some enthusiasm about it, but I think it was one of, it's one of those things that doesn't really translate well online. It's kind of detailed and you need to see it up close. Yeah. I didn't really appreciate that. It's also not one of those pieces that really lends itself to a certain, like a specific audience, like yeah. the beer bars map, which has like, okay, are you into beer? This is for you. So that didn't do as well, but you know, I still felt like I was on to something. I think it's so interesting to hear you talk about the marketability of it and the posi- like, and who it appeals to and stuff. Because just thinking back to we've been doing mastermind meetings every two weeks, you mm-hmm. and I, for I don't know a couple of years now or Long something time. like that. Yeah, and we're often talking about what's appealing and just these subtle little things about what's going to make somebody buy a print. Mm-hmm. And so it's interesting to hear you talk about the, the second one with, with, I'm sure you didn't have that clarity at the time. Not at all. It was more like, Oh, what's, what's wrong here? Like this, I feel like this is a better piece. It's been a year doing this. Ooh. It's, you know, what's this is, this got to feel like, every, yeah, like it took a long time. Just, a lot of after hours stuff working on like Friday nights up to like two in the morning. Which part of it was taking, making it take so much time? It just, I would just work on it like a section at a time. So I'd be like, I'd do like two square inches at a time. And it's, you know, and now it's a, it's like an aerial map of East Chicago. Yeah. With, with the, the, the lake. Yeah. What are some of the details that were in there? It's a panorama view, the bird's eye view map from about Hyde Park all the way up to Wrigleyville. So all the buildings, all the buildings. Okay. And I wanted to do every single building up to Halstead. Yeah. So I really wanted to get it right. I wanted to draw, you know, all the harbors with little boats and stuff like that. So it just, it, yeah, it was just a lot of detail to get right. So yeah. And you were getting really interested in, in these details, 
but they weren't details that were capturing people's imaginations when they looked at the. I think it was. Map. It's just one of those pieces that's that's more interesting in person when you can really get up to it. Yeah. If you if you just share an image on a, and somebody sees it on a device, it's just kind of like washed out. It's like, mm-hmm. and, you know, if you, you can blow it up, but it's just not the same. Well, we talked about this with, um, I can remember the name of the woman that's very extremely successful here in Ravenswood. Uh, orc posters? The orc posters, yeah. yeah. She, and hers are very, the concept is very clear. Yeah. It reads well. And, and for people who are listening, I'm sure you've seen the posters. It is basically sans serif typography of the different neighborhoods in a city made in the shape of those neighborhoods. It's one of these things that you can look at on a mobile device yeah. and you get it. Yeah. I mean, it's just really striking and it's, yeah, it makes a bold statement for sure. And I think with, with the one that I did, it was just a little bit too, it, I don't know. It just didn't read well, didn't translate well to, um, to the digital space. So how did that feel? You you worked on it for a year. It's like, oh fuck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, this won't take it. Was and had like, you quit at this point? No, I hadn't I had not. It just felt like trying to start a fire in the rain. You know, it's <laughs> like you know, you send it out, it's like you just get a lot of like lukewarm responses. Whereas the beer map, I put it up one place and it just was shared. Mm-hmm. Um, it took it took very little, so that was a good lesson. It was like, okay, I need to think about in terms of like digital marketing, like for something to catch on or to go viral, it really needs to be very clear, something that's easily seen, easily understood online, and also maybe should have a point of view or kind of a niche, like an audience in mind. Yeah. And that's what led me to do the marathon map. And that's the point that I. So left. you, you took that. I'll say you probably felt like that was a defeat. Yeah. You worked on this thing for a year. Mm-hmm. And then when you bounced back and regrouped from that, mm-hmm. you maybe looked at things you had learned at the Swedish, is it called Swedish? Uh, this is Sweden. Or at, at the consulting with the, the Swedish entrepreneurs and made sure that you were making something that was for a particular audience, which by the way, Chicago is an audience, but that's why there's a lot of competition there. So, you know, you kind of went for something that was a little bit easier to uh, slightly smaller market, still big market. Yeah. It was one of those, it's almost like I needed to have a, like a sentence, like, uh, when somebody sees like the beer map, like, oh, my husband loves craft beer. Is insert special occasion is coming up. Yeah, this is perfect. Oh, that's awesome. Yes, you know. So I think I took that, you know, that model or like that idea to the marathon map, mm-hmm. and that turned out to be one of my most successful products. I think that's and you run marathons. Yes. Well, that's the thing. So again, it was in line with my interests. So I quit my job, my full-time job. And then I was kind of like figuring things out. And I remember like hanging out with you at co-working spaces. (laughs) Remember? Right. Yes. We were like doing some free trials. We did like platform. And then I think you got a membership at one downtown. Yeah. I remember meeting up with you. And then I was like, okay, I still wasn't all in on the illustration and the prints because I was like, oh, I don't know if I could really make this work. But then I remember working on the marathon map. It's like, I'm running the marathon. I'll like learn the course by illustrating the map. And I also think this will correct some, it's like a correction in course going back to the, to the beer bars concept. And I remember showing you. At, the, at one of the covering spaces, and you were like, "Oh, I think this is going to be big." <laughs> I was like, "Oh, okay, that was en- uh, that was encouraging." Oh, cool. Yeah, you you saw I it. Remember. I feel like nobody else, you know, saw it. Oh, really? I didn't show like everybody, but I don't think people would have gotten it. They would have been like, "Yeah, 
Yeah. They, what are you doing? What were, what were people's reactions when you showed I, them? I don't think I showed a lot of people, but I think, I think you were the only person I showed who, who like understood. Connect the dots that this is a marketable yes, right. thing that's going to capture something very deep within people. Yeah. And I think is that, is that they're investing so much of their energy and time in, in this, doing this marathon is so important to them. Right. And for you to be able to create something for them that will uh, help them relive that and connect with that and put it on their wall. And this is something we've talked about a lot. I think is is like, this is something that goes on somebody's wall. Like, Mm -hmm. what does that, what does that mean to them? What is it? What are they saying about themselves as a person? This is stuff I'm talking about with books a lot as well. Cocktail party test. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, how is it solving their one of their problems or how is it really meeting one of their deep wants? And I think people want something that shows their identity yeah. off that, um, that's like memory. It has, you know, this reminds me of, uh, I was re-listening to an episode that's coming out next week and I wish I would have followed up on this, but Tim Casher from, from cursive and the good life, the, uh, the amazing rock star, who was talking about how he was doing cursive, which was like this emo hardcore thing. And he said this thing in that interview, which was basically, Oh, when I switched to the good life and it was and when I started doing the good life and it was this folk style, I thought some people would not really like that. I was deviating from this angsty voice that I, uh, I think I remember the word he used, but it was basically like that. I s- spoke to for them or, you know, mm-hmm. that, that recognition that the songs that he's creating are, are there to give people something to attach their own memories and their own feelings to. Mm-hmm. Right. And is this, this something that you found in figuring out what's marketable right. in, in creating your, your art? I think, yeah, I mean, I think there's something about using your specific experiences and that becomes general. It becomes something people really respond to. I remember reading an interview of St. Adam Durkowitz or Durwitz, the lead singer of Counting Crows. He was talking about his first album. And he said, uh, it was all about my very specific personal experiences. Mm-hmm. And he was like, and I was kind of surprised to see that that actually like appealed to everybody. Did you ever listen to the revisionist history episode with Malcolm Gladwell talking about how um, country music is more specific yes. in its lyrics. I did. Yeah. And uh, other genres. Yeah. I didn't quite buy it, but <laughs> I heard that one. Well, yeah. yeah. Cause we were talking about the strawberry wine or the, you know, the exact things. Yeah. Um, which I think is a, is a balance that, you can strike as it's much like finding a niche. It's much like the niche, the difference between doing marathon maps and doing a map of Chicago, right? Like yeah. if you could sell a drawing of Chicago to everybody who is interested in Chicago, that'd be amazing. But there's so much competition there. Exactly. But if you go with the, the maps and it's, it can be the same thing with specificity in art of the specific thing that you are interested in or that, that you, you really geek out about. Mm-hmm. Um, can really resonate with people. Right. Yeah, that's why I think it's sometimes, yeah, if you, yeah, if you use your own experience and interests as a, as a launching off point, it's, it's maybe better than trying to come up with something that's going to appeal to everybody. Like, you know, oh, map of Chicago, you know, three million people live in Chicago. This is going to be, that's the market. That's the market. What I've learned is when people are buying more general Chicago maps from me, they're actually buying it for somebody who no longer lives in Chicago or they're buying it because they're moving away from oh, really? Chicago. Interesting. Because I'm thinking, yeah, like why would you necessarily want to have a map of the city where you live? The dog is going crazy. Yeah, he's kind of really sees that bird. Oh, yeah, they're out there. It's keeping us safe. Um, 
so uh, yeah, so then I then I did the marathon map, and you know that's that has, has done really well. We're gonna take a quick break. I am so thrilled to have Skillshare back as a sponsor of Love Your Work. I know that you will love Skillshare because you are a Love Your Work listener, and Love Your Work listeners love to learn. Skillshare is an online learning platform with over 18,000 classes in business, marketing, entrepreneurship, technology, much, much more. A class that I personally really enjoyed is called Real Productivity, Create Your Ideal Week with Skillshare founder and CEO, Michael Carjanapricorn. And Michael has an impressive command over managing his time and mental energy. If you look at my calendar, you'll see that it's color-coded. So anything that's in gray are recurring meetings. Anything yellow is a signal that anyone could put a meeting in that time block. Anything in red are like tasks or things I do on a day-by-day basis. Join the millions of students already on Skillshare today with a special offer just for my listeners. Get two months of Skillshare for just 99 cents. 99 cents, you can't buy a decent pen for 99 cents. Anyway, that is right. Skillshare is offering Love Your Work listeners two months of unlimited access to over 18,000 classes for just 99 cents. To sign up, go to skillshare.com slash loveyourwork. Again, go to skillshare.com slash loveyourwork to start your two months now. If you're a creative entrepreneur, you need more than just a beautiful website. You need a powerful website. Success isn't just getting your products online. It's getting your products into the hands of the customers who will love them. I'm honored to have Weebly sponsoring Love Your Work. With Weebly, you don't just get an easy to build website with great looking templates. And by the way, as a designer, I have to say, Weebly's templates are stunning. With Weebly, your website is not just beautiful. You also get tons of tools to help you turn that website into a business. This means features to help promote your products, process payment, manage inventory, send marketing campaigns, and get discovered by new customers. You know, stuff that gets you paid. Stuff at the intersection of your love and money Venn diagram. Weebly is offering 15% off just for Love Your Work listeners at weebly.com slash loveyourwork. That's right. As a fan of Love Your Work, go to weebly.com slash loveyourwork. That's weebly, W-E-E-B-L-Y dot com slash loveyourwork, and you'll get 15% off when you sign up for your online store. Weebly, more than just a beautiful website. Now, talk about what you have learned. Um, you do the marathon maps. You've, you've been doing shows and stuff. Mm-hmm. I, think that, I feel like there was a point in our discussions where you, things started to really click for you as far as understanding what was going to appeal to people and what people were going to buy. Mm-hmm. And I feel like part of that was selling to people in person mm-hmm. at shows that you, that you set up booths at and stuff. Yeah, definitely. I think that was one of those epiphanies that I had where I was like, you know, doing more stuff, creating more, more pieces that I thought would really you know, that spoke to me and I thought it would speak to other people and just not quite getting the right, you know, enthusiasm for it. It's like, why isn't this, why isn't this going? Like, why aren't people getting it? Then I started to realize, yeah, not everybody is comfortable buying stuff online, buying prints online. They, they want to see them in person. They want to feel them. They want to look at it. And so just in doing kind of the first shows where I actually had like a good amount of inventory and just getting like great responses. So at this point you have 20, 30, I mean, we're starting to go to shows. Yeah. By the time I I did a few shows when I just had a few and those turned out to be bad because it's like, I didn't know what I was doing. I remember going to this beer event where I had the one, I had one product, the beer bar map. Yeah. And I had like had it on an easel frames. <laughs> and then it just had like a stack of them on a table. And I was like, why aren't people buying this? They love beer. They're here to buy, you know, they're here to like drink beer. It was like, it just didn't, I don't know. It didn't look impressive. Like it looked probably more pathetic. Also, it was just people are there to drink. They're not there to get artwork, like walk around with a tube. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, I think it was more just like learning about 
just distribution. It was like, okay, I have something I think people will like. I figured out, okay, you need to do stuff that's in special interest. People buy it for an occasion. Now, what's the best way to like get it in their hands? Or like, how do they actually prefer to buy these things? And there's only, there's only so much you can do online, I think, for this category. You can definitely sell it online and I can definitely get sales online, but the shows are where you really get a good, you get, you get a good conversion. You get mm-hmm. for the number of people you see uh, versus the number of people who buy, it's, it's, they're like well worth it. So. Yeah, last year was kind of the first year I like did like quite a few larger shows and had like a larger portfolio of stuff. And then this year is is even bigger in terms of the number of shows that I'm doing. And it's just you know, you find people people just want to see it. It's just how they want to buy it. And and have you learned things about the content of of the work that you know what people respond to and what they what they don't. Oh yeah, hundred percent. I think that's another advantage of being there. It's like you see these um, these apps like Lucky Orange that you know show you what your customers are doing on your website, but you can't like hear what they're saying. Yeah, you can see where they're clicking the heat maps, and it's like. At the shows are like lucky orange, except you're like observing them. You know, you can overhear what they're saying, you hear them more like they're whispering to the spouse and stuff, and like you hear why they're buying it. And then you just do like an informal poll, like informal survey when they're checking out. Like, oh, what's are you buying this for yourself? It's a gift. Like, you know, where are you going to put this? Um, and then you start to learn things like, oh, okay. When people are buying this, they're thinking about framing it, of course. They're not just going to put thumbtacks on the wall like we all did when we were in, in uh, middle school. So then I started thinking about, okay, how can I make this even easier for people to make the decision? So I put up, like, oh, it's a, it's a standard size frame. It's, they're all standard frame sizes, 11 by 14 or 18 by 24. And here's a place where you can go, go to Michael's. They have tons of frames in this option or go this, this route or do this. If you're going to go custom framing, like reduce the friction involved in the transaction, make it as easy as possible for people to, to make the decision. Don't like give them the product and a problem. Yeah. Give them the product, solve their the problem, of like decorating in place and give them another solution to the second problem, which is framing it. I remember one of the crucial works being the Chicago ABCs Mm -hmm. of seeing the way people interacted with that, right? Yeah. That was one of those pieces where we put it up. And Chicago ABCs, for people who are listening, is basically a, a, a monument or something in Chicago for each letter of the alphabet. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's like A is for Adler... B is for the bean, C is for the cup, stuff like that. And you put that up and you see people just stop and want to interact with it. Like A, A is for Adler, B is for bean. And they say the whole thing the out whole loud. Whole thing out loud. Right? Whole thing out loud. They always get stuck on D, which is deep dish. And then they're like, and Z is for zoo. Oh my God, we have to get this. Yeah. You know, it's like there's a payoff. Now they can educate someone else. I didn't put what the letters were on the print because I wanted it to be one of those things you have to be in the know. You you let them complete the or close the loop in a way. It, yeah, it reminds me of uh, Cards Against Humanity. How they kind of make a joke. Oh, it's the Cards Against Humanity. Give us five dollars sale. Yeah, uh, and to complete the joke, you have to give them five dollars. <laughs> right, but. I mean, you're letting them work a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, you know, there's this mental bias of whatever you pay attention to suddenly becomes more important. Right. Right. So you're giving them something to grab onto to 
some mental work to do looking at it. Mm-hmm. And then next thing you know, they've gone through the whole alphabet. They've been standing there for yeah, five minutes, 10 minutes. Right. And I think, yeah, I think, you know, people like to invest in their time and something is, yeah, that makes it worth something to them. And also like providing opportunities for people to actually grab the work, like putting a flipper out so people can flip through pick it up and like touch it literally have it in their hands yes you know most of the time if they pick it up look at it up close they want it they're gonna buy it <laughs> <laughs> and now you and, and did you know this when you before you started going to shows no not at all I just just process of discovery and yeah just just observing people and yeah, I mean, yeah, that's that's the beauty of the show is it's like you you take the information in, you kind of gather it, analyze it, and then hopefully do the next one better. Now, where did home portraits start? That started in the same period, like right after I had left my job and I was working on the marathon map. And that was a case where I just had this vision in my head of like pen and ink, pen and ink homes, like struck by the homes around me. And I just had this vision of doing like three, two flats in a row. And I remember just working on that just one day. I was like, oh, I just, I've been thinking about this for a long time. It's just a vision. So I drew... And of course, you love architecture. and Yeah, I've always loved architecture and I've always loved Chicago architecture. And I always There's felt... a lot of beautiful two flats yeah, all over Chicago. But in a, three flats and all sorts of... But I also thought it was weird that they weren't celebrated that much. Like if you, if you go to the Chicago Architecture Foundation, it's all about the Art Deco skyscrapers, the first skyscrapers, the the plan of the city, the uh, Hancock building, but you're not, you know, you don't get like a a big celebration of like these amazing two flats and bungalows and very distinct. That people live in. Exactly. People live in. It's like, I feel like the celebration of architecture in Chicago, a lot of it is is for the tourists like what they see in the loop you know and there wasn't as much for the native Chicago and the one who lives here so that's kind of the motivation that I had to do the two flats and I just remember working on the two flats like maybe two days or something and just working on it till four or five in the morning just like in a fury I was like just so into it. Just time starts melting away. Yeah. I was like, that's yeah, always, I got to finish. No, you're onto something then. Yeah. And I finished and I was like, Oh man, I really like how this turned out. And I thought, Oh man, I could just, maybe I could do these four people. It's custom. Like, I'll do this like person. I was thinking, yeah, there's probably, you know, a hundred, 200,000 homes in Chicago. Like, Lots of homeowners, lots of, you know, everybody lives in some, well, not everybody, (laughs) but, uh, yeah. A lot of people live in something. A lot of people live in something and they're proud of it. And it kind of comes back to the thing with the marathon map where it's like you're getting it for some occasion. Yeah. And I just decided, oh, I'm just going to make a page in my site using this image. And just say, I do home portraits. And that was really it. Just like a paragraph. Like, you I just do, put it on the site. Katie put, put it on there for you. Yeah, she probably did it for and me. This yeah. was still the hand coded. Yeah, it was. I, I still couldn't really do any of it myself. So it's just a paragraph. Like, I do custom home portraits and, you know, just email me for the price. And then I just put that image up. And then I just emailed it to like a few Chicago magazines and I emailed it to, um, I think one of them is Chicago, like something like Chicago home and garden or something like that. Or I forget what the first one was Chicago interiors. 
And they were just like, oh, this is cool. Like, yeah, we'll write a piece about this. <laughs> like, I hadn't done a single own portrait at that point. And this is like the... And Not a custom one, but you, you had no. drawn homes, but you just hadn't... I'd only drawn those Chicago homes, those three. Those, those two flats. Over that 48-hour period. And um, so it, I think I, what I was thinking of is we had also done like that year, I think we did, we did the lean startup competition. So I was in the mentality of MV, like a minimum viable product. So like, how can I do something that's like, like the Grubhub yeah. concept where you, you just put it out there and see how people respond. And so I did that and they were like, yeah, we'll write about this. So they wrote a, like, did a short write up, put it out on their, on their website. They put it on the face, put it on Facebook, put it on Twitter. It was like, here's a, you know, put it back to the article. And then I just got like some orders from that. And then was it just a flood of orders or was it wasn't it? a flood of orders from that point? It was maybe five to 10 orders at that point. But then probably a week later, or a few weeks later, um, this company that's like Thrillist for women, they probably came first actually. So Thrillist is probably like this company for men. It was called Daily Candy. I don't oh, yeah. You ever remember oh, that? Oh, sure. They contacted me. They're like, we saw this article in Chicago Interiors and we want to write about it and send it out to our, our um, followers or our subscribers. So they sent out that like a whole thing about the home portraits. And at that point I had a few examples. So they sent that out to their thousands of followers. And then I maybe got like probably almost a hundred home portrait orders from that. You had a hundred? It was a lot. Probably over the course of months. It was a oh, lot. Okay. Yeah. I, I thought then, you were like, saying like a hundred at once. Like, okay, I have to draw a hundred houses. It was a lot of inquiries at once, but I remember just that flood of orders just kept me busy. And you were charging what for these? I was charging a very low amount. I was charging $125 yeah. for like a standard eight by 10. To draw a whole house. Yeah. So I was working on that. I remember just like work, like doing home portrait after home portrait after home portrait for like, yeah, for months. It took me into the winter. I was doing like, a lot of people were, ordering, this was in the fall, people were ordering it for Christmas. Oh, and yeah. And I got to the point where I was like, oh, I can't, can't take anymore. So I was just like, give, I made a card that said, oh, I, you know, that people could give to their, to the recipient saying, I ordered you a home portrait. It's coming in February. <laughs> so <laughs> when they ordered, were they expecting to get it before Christmas? Like how did the customers react when you were? No, for the ones that, ordered for Christmas, I got to a point where I was like, uh, oh, I can't deliver this. Anybody after time. this. Yeah. So I was, it was never like, and people were still, were still ordering. Yeah. They're like, oh, it's fine. So yeah. they could, as long as they had something to give to their significant other, whoever they were giving it and to. Were them. you at all tired of drawing houses yeah, at that point? I got really tired. <laughs> I got really tired of it after a while. Uh, so then, yeah, but then I, you know, then those orders started drying up and then started raising my prices. So I got it down to like a manageable level. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Hey, but that was, sounds like it was kind of your, your first big, I don't know. Well, I, it, you were, you were full time at that point. Yeah. It was like wind in my sails. It's like, yeah. Oh, I had the marathon map come out. You know, that was a success. And then this came out and this is a success. So and do you have all these houses. Do you, do you retain rights of reproduction of all of these houses that you uh, do? It wasn't anything that I explicitly put in there, but it's something that I checked up on. Yeah. It's that artists retain the right of reproduction just by default. Oh, okay. So unless the copyright is explicitly passed on to the person who's commissioning you. Right. Art artist. for hire. Yeah. Is what that's called, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that art for hire has to be explicitly uh defined right and it wasn't so you exactly. have rights so you could produce a book mm -hmm. uh have you re remixed any of these into well then i turned after a while i turned some of these home portraits into kind of greatest hits compilations 
like home styles of Chicago, individual home styles, like my favorite Greystones, my favorite bungalows. Yeah. And those, those are a huge hit. People really like those. Right. And uh, so which one is it that is in the big sick? Uh, yeah. It's, the, a mo- it's a great movie. People should check it out, but uh, there's, it's over, over the shoulder of, you can see it a couple times, I think, in the movie. Yeah, it's in her apartment set of the lead actress. Yeah, and it's it's the three flat. It's the three two flat image. The first one that I did. Yeah, it's oh, that, that the piece. first one, the yeah. one before you even the did one the, that started everything. The one that you felt so compelled to draw that you were up all night. Yeah, drawing it. Yep, it's that one. It's funny how that works. I know, and it's interesting that that one. I had the piece up on my site and it sells okay, just a few here and there. But it's still the one that really speaks to me. The one that I think I just, yeah, I've always liked it. And I think it's, it has maybe some kind of staying power. Weirdly, like it's still my Facebook banner and still one that I. Well, if Hollywood's putting it in their movies, it's still got a couple more years before the mainstream catches on. Yeah, I think so. That's yeah. what it is. You're, they're, they're trend setting. Well, I also have the, the marathon map in the movie Blockers. Okay. So, yeah. I didn't know it was a marathon map that was in Blockers. It's yeah. the marathon map and a few others. They bought maybe eight prints from me, but that's the only one that I know for sure. And how does that happen? They just email you out of the blue. Yeah, it's and the, you maybe you check your spam folder one day and you're like, oh, <laughs> good thing I found this one. Yeah, exactly. It's just from the production designer, the set designer. And they're like, hey, like we're doing a movie that's supposed to be set in Chicago. Like we'd like some of your prints. Like I just sell it to them for, uh, you know, I don't charge them any premium. Just they pay for whatever everybody else pays. When I was, I was talking to a set designer for um, the show Easy. I've also had a piece that appears in Easy. And she was like, Oh yeah, some she probably shouldn't have told me this. She's like, some artists like, you know, they really squeeze us and they like, you know, charge a lot for us to use their their art. She's like, Some artists fail. don't know. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm one that doesn't really know. Yeah. Well someday you you can work up to squeezing them. Yeah. But you know, it's like every every production needs to have a, a cape horn illustration. Uh, yeah, for me it's just like bragging, bragging rights. Yeah, you can put it up on your website and stuff. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah, yeah. I really like how uh, we've talked about this. I think from the beginning, you're you're able to take kind of brand equity that's for at least in the United States, right? Architecture is not copyrighted, right? Right. I think in the you know in Europe, maybe it is. Um, that's and also good. people have city pride. They love, they love Chicago and that's a market in itself. And there's, there's plenty of publications that cover things relative to a city. Mm-hmm. Movies are set in certain places. Like mm-hmm. we, we live in places right. and you're able to take some of that brand equity that doesn't cost anything mm-hmm. and that's freely available. Right. And that's part of what makes a piece of art that a person can identify with such that they want to, to buy it, put it on their wall and right. everything. Is this something that you think about more as you decide what you're going to work on? Yeah, definitely. It's, I think people have to build some bridge to a piece of my experience. They have to, when they're coming up to my booth and see something, they're like, Oh, Oh my God. Like, uh, you know, grandma lived in a bungalow on, in Bridgeport. Yeah. This is like, this, is, this piece celebrates bungalows. If yeah. it was, what, what would be like the most mundane thing? It could be like a vase with flowers in it, maybe, or, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. What do you mean? Like, I mean, like, what would be the, the most unlikely thing to connect with somebody in a way? I'm just trying to think of examples of what would be the opposite of yeah. having something that they can have this story to go along with. Yeah, well, I mean, the opposite would just be like a nice, a nice piece. Like you kind of have to, like if you did a still life or something, 
then you're kind of waiting for somebody to come along and be like, oh, this would fit in our place. Like the colors would work in our place or maybe... There's something stylistically... Yeah, you know, like maybe this reminds me of, of something and that there's some reason why it's calling out to me. Like, you know, we bought this screen print on our wall. It's like a, a tree. It's a tree screen print just because it like fits in with the color scheme right. of our place. And I think that's... I'm looking at the, your, the urns that you have too. And yeah. You know, what those, those actually just came very randomly. They're beautiful. They're very ornate and everything. Come from Afghanistan, actually. Um, but those were kind of like, yeah, they just happened to fit. It's, I, we got them as a wedding present. Oh. And then they just happened to work there. Um, and the colors too, right? They, just, they, they, yeah, they fit in with the rest of your interior. Right, right. Yeah, it's just that's a happy accident. But I guess when you're like trying to sell some art, like if you're just relying on somebody to walk by who happens to have the color scheme or it happens to speak to them, then you could be waiting a while. And I think that's why some artists kind of like. You know, when they do pieces that are just like pretty, nice to look at, like you might have to price it kind of high, like wait for that buyer who's going to yeah. come by and say, oh, it speaks to me so much that I'm willing to spend a thousand dollars to make it worth that artist's time to have waited that long. Whereas, you know, if they're doing something that's really speaking to somebody on like, they know like they're bungalow owners and they're people who love graystones or Chicago architecture. You're going to find a lot more people identify. Like, I think that even more extreme example is at a place like Comic-Con or C2E2, they have artists there who are selling fan arts, like, like beautiful prints of like the Starship Enterprise. Yeah. And they, you know, I'm not sure how they get away with. I'm yeah, sure how they, does that work legally? They're doing it right under the noses of like these studios, so they must get away with it somehow. Maybe they have to pay a fee, like a licensing fee or something. But they they can sell those hand over fist. It's like, oh, I love Star Trek. This yeah. this piece is going to show everybody how much I love Star Trek. You know. Um, so yeah, I think it's just it's one of those things in art that. You, I think about a lot. It's like what, what really kind of drives somebody to to want to actually get this. And and it's funny because when you're talking about art, I think that there is a uh, intuitively people want to might have a reaction that there's something unappealing about this idea of trying to make your art saleable. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you struggled with yourself at all? You know, yeah. like a pure, a purist or purity type of mentality yeah. that may actually be holding you back. Well, I do think like if you, if something is like blatantly commercial, it really comes across as crass and just, it, there's, there's a turnoff. To people. Any examples that, um, yeah, let me think. I mean, I think that we've, we, we've joked about like if, if there was, uh, certain political things going on that you could, that a yeah. person could exploit. Right. That would be really crass. And yeah, like I, you see stuff like that, like pandering to certain viewpoints that you don't necessarily yeah. share yourself. Like Trump is the devil or something like that, where it's okay. Like maybe that's how you feel, but also like, are people going to put that on their wall? <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> Um, but yeah, I don't know. Like, I think, um, yeah, I guess my point is like, if something comes from a place where it's inspiring you or if it's speaking to you, it's, it comes across as a lot more authentic. Yeah. Again, I think that. naturally the the way the world works, that's naturally going to connect to certain people because we all live in this world. And so we have, certain experiences that a lot of us share and we're naturally going to have interests that, that we share or, you know, 
like like we were talking about, people live in this city, mm-hmm. and so everybody shares that. Right. And it, it's funny. I've been I've been reading the uh, the biography of of Vincent Van Gogh, mm-hmm. and it's interesting to hear that you know his uncle was one of the most successful art dealers in all of Europe. And for a few years, Vincent worked at the art dealership. He was terrible at it, but yeah. you know, he was seeing prints and he was seeing what people were buying right. all the time. And, uh, and it, when he did just decide to become an artist, he was thinking commercially, you know, he wanted to make a living and he was looking at it as a business Right. Um, you know, he had moments where he did still say like, no, I'm only going to do what interests me, but he was still thinking about that stuff. I think there's a balance right. somewhere, somewhere to be struck. So how, how did he not work? Like <laughs> when he produced, when he made a painting, like how did it not get in front of people who would like want it? Like, oh, right. buy it? Was he bad at like getting it in front of people or like Ooh. would people actually see it and like, reject it be like oh no like i haven't gotten that far yet okay. but uh yeah well, we, we will see i some, maybe somebody listening knows but yeah um call in he, he was definitely in in the art world in in that way but yeah like he didn't have the best well it was his uncle who was this great art dealer he didn't have the best relationship with his family and because mm-hmm. he was just like failing at everything right. and he was mooching so much money off of his, his family right. all the time. So, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know, uh, what happened there. Cause I could maybe. see him as maybe one of those people who like, who paints and then kind of like has all the paintings in his studio or in his home oh, just yeah. surrounding him not quite knowing them what to do with it, like how to get it out in the world. Cause if you don't, if you don't have that person who's like believing in you, like yeah. a dealer, I like, feel like maybe a lot of artists need that, that dealer who's like putting it out there. Like they're selling it. Yeah. Then, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. know what happened with that, but he would, I mean, I wouldn't say that he was savvy Yeah, as far as marketing and all that stuff goes. He was thinking about it. And then he also had all that experience that he, probably absorbed through osmosis, I would imagine. Right. I mean, it's just an interesting thing to, to, to learn more about this figure that you assume is just, oh, he was a failure and then he died. And then after that, his paintings were super successful and it was just mm-hmm. some miracle or accident. Yeah. But I mean, he had a lot of things matching up for yeah. him. But I mean, it, as far as purity goes, there's also this idea of, of, um, you know, you sell prints, right? Mm-hmm. And some people maybe look look down upon that. Is that mm-hmm. something that you have struggled with yourself? Yeah, I, I would say that. I mean, um, to me, it was kind of some like people, some people think, "Oh, it's got to be an original," or I don't right. know what the different philosophies are in the in the you art know, there's, world. There's like different worlds. There's like different uh, silos. I feel like you yeah. Know, there's like People who are more in the gig posters world, yeah, that are just pretty much just down the line. They're like screen printers, and they're pretty, you know, fundamentalist about screen printing. And then you have the fine artists who are pretty fundamentalist about selling originals. And that seems like such a game of. It seems like there would be a highly political game, yeah, of. Oh, I gotta, I've gotta get in good with this gallery owner, yeah. this art dealer, like you were, right. you're talking about. Oh, or Picasso was always, uh, schmoozing with, um, what was her name? She was, oh, Gertrude Stein. Mm-hmm. You know, she was very influential in Paris at the time. And, yeah. you know, he had his, his art dealers and, and all that stuff. And I can yeah. imagine, um, especially today when, you know, there's so many other entertainment options besides paintings. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, I think, you know, after the camera, you know, became like more widespread, like photography than painting kind of took a, a took a nosedive. Well, I mean, and then movies. And <laughs> yeah. Music, exactly. You don't have right. to play music on your piano. Right. So, <laughs> exactly. Like it, it has different 
art, the purpose of art in somebody's life who is going to buy it, it right. kind of changed. Yeah, at the same time, we're living in a world living in a world where fine art is going for astronomical prices, right? At at auction, and so it's interesting. It's almost like, but that's like you're you've got a. I don't know if you're talking about classic fine art or, or contemporary both. fine art, but both. but I mean that seems like a, a game where you really got to appeal to this point one percent yeah of the population right and yeah well I think about the that world a lot just kind of like just interested in it it's like how can like how can a Damien Hurst be sell for fifty million dollars and another contemporary artist's work just never sell. Like who decides yeah. that uh, the stuffed shark is worth more than, you know, like something else that might be equally interesting. There's and, an Adam ruins everything about, about this. Oh really? <laughs> about the art world. Yeah. Well, it's, it's fascinating to me. And I think that is a world where there's like clear gatekeepers. They're like, it's, it's the established galleries, you know, the ones who have some, they have a brand. So they have a brand, then they attract like the right wealthy clientele. They yeah. have to be wealthy clientele. And then they confer value on the work that they hold at their gallery or choose to display. So, you know, there's a very select number in like key art markets of like galleries that have that kind of branding. Whereas the other ones, they kind of pop up, disappear, um, you know, show, you know, maybe you have work doesn't, doesn't go, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, they just don't have that kind of like staying power. Yeah. I mean, if you read about like what some of these galleries can do for new artists, it's like, it's amazing. Like to put them in the same category. I was like, oh, I'm showing Damien Hurst right. this week. And the next week, it's this new artist I discovered. It's like immediately it confers this like stratospheric value to that new artist. Is that a route that you ever considered going yourself? It's not a route that I considered going, but it's, you know, it's something that could be it's something that's interesting, but. It's one of those routes that is like, it's just like with any other business, there are gatekeepers. And I think this is a very extreme example yes. of a gatekeeper because it's not like you can necessarily say that it's a, you can't objectively say this is a better mousetrap. You know, maybe it's a more compelling piece of art, but it's still coming down to one person's decision, like about whether they consider it to be more compelling piece of art than another. So it doesn't sound like it was a route that you considered and you're on this kind of other route. There's really no gatekeepers to a few gatekeepers on this route that you're in. Yeah, well, it's. I think I found this route because I was just asking myself, what do people want? And what's the best way to deliver it to them? And was being able to spend a lot of time drawing important to you in this decision? Um, I mean, out of all the businesses you could have started, yeah, started one when you're when you're drawing all day, right? That was more because, oh, it's something where I have a little competitive edge on people. I can draw better than average, and I enjoy doing it. Doesn't feel like work, so it just makes sense. I guess, yeah. I mean, if I was I was a chef or like, you know, knew how to make chocolate or something, that could have been the route that I would go down, but I just felt like this is something where the production side of it just feels like joy. Like it's not, it doesn't feel like a slog or anything like that. Like I could, I lose myself in it and meditate while I draw, like I I get in a flow state. So I think that, that more than anything just made it kind of an easy choice to, to pursue. Um, yeah, I mean, at this point, I couldn't see myself doing much else. <laughs> <laughs> and you're also, 
I like that you're using it as a conduit through which to learn about these things. You said even with the first map, mm-hmm. oh, I'm interested in craft beers anyway. This will be a way for me to learn yeah. about craft beers. Or the marathon map, this will be a way for me to learn the route right. anyway. Yeah. And also, you know, exploring the architecture of Chicago with oh yeah everything that you're doing. I mean, yeah, now I'm doing a CTA prints and I'm learning all about the CTA cars. Like everything was involved in like that building the CTA. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, and, and it just opens up worlds. Like the beer map, I still I'm still in touch with people in the beer world. They're friends. I just have have trivia under my belt. I can say like I've ex- like had different experiences that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Yeah. And uh yeah, I think exploring like place more than anything, like knowing more about the place I live. I feel like if I was living in um Colorado or something, like I might be doing I might be doing pieces like of of the Rocky Mountains. Yeah. And I would just because of And that would connect with people. Yeah, we connect with people. A lot of people love the Rocky Mountains. They love Colorado, even people who don't live there. Right. Yeah, it would, it would just you know, give me a reason to really dive in and and explore it, like really research it and understand it. Um, so yeah, it's just it's just hit all the buttons. Cool. Um, yeah. So if there is anybody out there who you think would uh, if there's anybody out there who's thinking about starting to make prints or be an artist in, in the way that you're, you're doing it, I mean, do you have a final message that would kind of wrap up what we're saying, what we were talking about today? I would say, first of all, just go for it. Like, follow your own interests. Like, if you love, you know, if you love, Rembrandt or something like that who speaks to you and you like, you know, the type of subject matter that you cover, like just make it. But understand that, you know, you may have an audience that's not there yet. So you also have to spend a lot of time like listening to them. Just make it, listen to your audience. You take it to a show and Everybody walks by, you make no sales. Like you gotta learn from that. Like yeah. I feel like too many times I see artists like cursing the audience. Oh, because you you I mean I'm sure you see artists at these shows who go to show after show after show and never yeah. learn yeah. why their work isn't selling. Yeah, it's kinda tough. Like to have a booth and be selling well and you see the person is already right across from you, not sell anything all day. You know, you just have to ask, like, are you really understanding your customers here? Like, you're, like, are you just making this because you love to make it? That's fine. But you want to make a living as an artist. And I feel like most people who have a booth at a place like that want to be making a living as an artist. Ask yourself, what am I doing wrong? I can't, people are just not going to buy it only because it's, well executed you can buy because it's speaking to them and they can build a bridge to it there's a reason like what's the motivation so follow your interest it's kind of a starting point but then always look at the other side of the equation and ask is this really addressing what people want yeah and i feel like once you get both of those uh once you get both those sides of the equation and you're, you, know, you have the makings of something like the seeds of a, of a, a viable, you know, uh, venture. Well, this has been a fun conversation. Where can people find more of you? They can go to my website, which is c a p e h o r n hyphen illustration dot com. It's illustration singular, or they can follow me on Instagram which is cape underscore horn underscore C-H-I. All right. Bill Thompson, thanks so much for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me.
Is Love Your Work helping you find the intersection on your love and money Venn diagram? Does it bring you the inspiration and motivation to make you into the person that you want to be? If so, we, together, you and I, can make this the show that we want it to be. I'm trying to make a nourishing and thoughtful show, and I could use your help with that. Please donate to the show. Just a coffee a month will help support the hosting and production of this show. Just a coffee a month will help spread Love Your Work's message, helping more people live a balanced life with a healthy definition of success. To donate, visit our Patreon page at kadavy.net slash donate. Patreon is a platform that lets you support creators like me. Vote with your dollars and keep Love Your Work going at kadavy.net slash donate. As a thank you, you'll get early access, bonus content, and a discount on Love Your Work merchandise. Learn more at kadavy.net slash donate. That's kadavy.net slash donate. Love Your Work is brought to you in part by our Patreon supporters, such as mini sponsor Roxana Maynard of Agility Alchemist at agilityalchemist.com and top supporters such as Arif Akhtar and Jeffrey Mason. This has been Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. The theme music for this show is At Sea by Dorena from the album About Everything and More by arrangement with Deep Elm Records at deepelm.com. Love Your Work is a production of Cadavy, Inc. <laughs>